Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for the 2022-2023 Computer Science Speaker Series. I'm your host, Anthony Kwan, with uh, the LA County Office of Education. I am the STEM, STEM Science Coordinator for all of LA County. Uh, I'm your first point of contact for all things STEM, STEM STEAM initiatives, NGSS, Computer Science Standards, uh, Environmental Education, and uh, Student Events. Um, I'm pleased to be joined and be uh, working in this partnership with the USC Viterbi School of Engineering and I'd like to introduce our partners from the Viterbi School of Engineering. Hi everyone, my name is Mary Bonaparte Soller. I am the Associate Director at the USC Viterbi K-12 STEM Center. So we do a lot of outreach and engagement with K-12 audiences uh, through our engineering school. Hello, my name is Michelle Email, and I am also with the um, Viterbi K-12 STEM Center. Um, I currently manage and coordinate our code.org programs, and I'm happy to be here tonight. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started with a little bit of an icebreaker just to kind of um, help us get warmed up and start to thinking uh, in the right direction. And so um, it's really a simple icebreaker. Um, we'd like for you to share a picture of a place you'd like to visit or a place that you have visited. And then we're all going to go around and discuss why we like this place so much. I was inspired. Um, I recently on Instagram started following this um, beautiful destinations website. And I, every time I'm looking through social media and there's something that's discouraged or challenging, I get to see these beautiful locations. And so I want us to kind of teleport ourselves and our minds into a positive space so that we can be ready to um, learn and do some really cool activities today. So take a moment to locate that picture on your phone, locate that picture on the internet, um, go, and uh, yeah, we're gonna come back and share with the group. Oh, and share in the chat if you can, so that we, have, we can all see the beautiful um, places. Well, it looks like we have a few in the chat now. You're on mute. Cool. Okay. Um, who would like to volunteer and go first? Um, you can add the link instead of the picture. Thanks, Debbie, for the clarification. I don't want to, vol I'll volunteer, but I, I definitely want to hear uh, from Mary, though. <laughs> <laughs> what was Mary? 
Oh my god! When when I cl clicked on the link, I, I just I just started dying. I'm like. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh wow! That is pretty amazing. Okay, Mary, you get voted to go first. Sure. Yeah. So my place is Hobbiton in New Zealand. Um, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan, and my husband and I were able to to visit there a couple years ago and do a tour there of. All the great spaces where they filmed the movie. Yeah, there it is. Cool. Oh yeah, that would be nice to share. Um, popcorn to someone, Mary. Uh, let's see. How about That's Miriam? Okay, mine is Tulum. It's a beach mm. in the Riviera Maya. It's just gorgeous, beautiful. And it was kind of like a dream come true. I, I always wanted to visit it. And when I finally did, it was the most beautiful experience ever. Yeah, I had a good time. <laughs> That's good. Thank you for sharing. Let's see. Let's pull up Robin. Uh, Robin? Sure, yeah. I did like the Redwood Forest, which I always find like when I'm like, just like in the middle of like tons of trees, it's like very, it's very calming to be surrounded by all these things that are so much, so much larger than yourself. So um, that was uh, my choice. Very cool. It, it's funny that I, I actually visited for the first time ever um, this spring. So I, I know what you're talking about is good. Oh, nice. <laughs> I feel like that about the waves. They take me to that place where I feel that they're bigger than you know, the earth and everything that's going on. So that's a nice feeling. Who hasn't gone? Me and Debbie? And, and me. And so oh, mine okay. is Hanaway Bay. Hanaway oh, Bay is cool. where I got married and it's it's it's, it's my go-to island. It's, it's the one I like the most. <laughs> Very good, Anthony. <laughs> Debbie, you ready? Oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. Okay. Maybe Give me that. the, it's like a Condé Nast <laughs> advertisement. <laughs> Just stop right there. Exactly. So this is my absolutely favorite place to walk. But if you could imagine me right on the water's edge and not near the buildings, that's even better. <laughs> I just, I don't like being, I like being close to home, but I just love walking right in the waves of the water. Very cool. That's so close by, I love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. It's not that like huge emotional and, and uh, expense to get there and you just, you get on vacation the second your toes hit the water. And the, the waves are there. That's my important thing to listen. I listened to the, I was telling someone, I listened to the way, um, I have Alexa play waves music for me. So that's why I'm inspired when I see these pictures. And then um, I'll go last. My picture is of, let's see if we can get it to come up. There you go. Some place I want to visit, Lake um, Victoria in Africa. Um, I just feel like it's surreal and um, this amazing place that you know nourishes a continent. And yeah, it's a beautiful pictures that I've seen, especially of the waterfall. So it's definitely a destination I'd like to make. All right. So did everybody win? That's good. Um, we're a small group, so we're going to keep moving along. Um, I have a couple of announcements, but um, most the most important thing that I want you to know and understand is that this is not the first, this is only the first one. The um, CS Speaker Series Partnership is an endeavor that is going to um, take place Four more times, and as Anthony mentioned, make sure that you tell all of your staff 
that this is an amazing place to spend an hour and a half on a Thursday um, with um, professors from USC and graduate students. And so there's gonna be so many connections that are made from this. Um, additionally, um, we are um, in the process of our um, cohort for code.org. Um, and we are working to um, have our workshops. Um, uh, we have a workshop this Saturday that Mary is hosting. So if you know any elementary school teachers who might want to uh, participate in a virtual CS fundamentals course, there's still room for that. As well as um, we are getting ready for um, CS Ed Week, which is going to be the first weekend in December, along with an hour of code. So there are a lot of resources um, and opportunities for you to continue to um, uh, gain more knowledge about computer science. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary. Thank you, Michelle. Great. Well, it is my pleasure, great pleasure to introduce to you today, Professor Robin Gia. Uh, Professor Robin Gia is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at USC. Uh, he's broadly interested in natural language processing and machine learning, which you will learn all about today. Um, he received his PhD in computer science at Stanford University, and after that spent some time as a visiting researcher uh, at Facebook AI Research. So uh, take it away, Professor Robin. We're very excited to hear about your work. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to be here, and I think this is a really, hopefully it should be a really fun topic to learn about, and we have some fun um, activities. Yeah, so Feel free to like kind of interrupt me at any time, especially because we're we're such a small group. Um, yeah, so yeah, let's let's get started. Um, so I wanted to talk about some things that are and do some activities about stuff that probably you've been seeing in the news, right? Related to um, AI. So, for example, just like two years ago, there was this thing that came out called GPT three. Um, and this is what's known as a language model. So it's something that's able to generate uh, text by basically looking at how human written text looks on the internet and trying to uh, replicate that. And that potentially has a lot of um, implications, right, that have been discussed in the news. Um, even more recently, there have been these really impressive uh, image generation models. So this is one called Dolly. Um, and you can see here what, what um, someone has done is they've typed in a, uh, a prompt that goes, uh, that's asked for a teapot in the shape of an avocado. And indeed it is able to produce, you know, something that more or less uh, fits the bill, right? And so it's, it's kind of impressive. It's able to kind of fuse these two unrelated concepts together and produce something that, that kind of makes sense. Um, at the same time, there's like, I think a lot of things that, that we should, questions we should be asking and wondering about what this progress means. So here's another article from earlier this year about these language models, right? And like. There's a lot of issues where, you know, even though what it might generate would sound fluent, perhaps it's actually not, not trustworthy, not always factual. And so there's a lot of uh, risks of potentially spreading things that are not true if we have these things generating text all, all over the place. Um, and uh, one thing that just happened a couple of weeks ago that, that was an interesting news story was that um, there was an uh, artist who used these AI tools to generate uh, this image that won first prize at like a digital art competition and then you know some people were uh, of course not very happy about that that sparked this whole discussion about what this means really for the future of uh you know art and and people who make their living as as illustrators for example um and so at a conceptual level i think one thing that's that's really interesting and hopefully for for students would also be interesting is to think about this idea of, of dual use that that's really pervasive throughout technology, right? So there's a lot of positives we can imagine from these sorts of AI technologies or so things like better chatbots, better translation tools, maybe tools that help you write better and also program better, right? So these, these machines, uh, AI systems can also generate code. And so you can imagine them helping uh, people program, right? Programs, right? You can create better art or even prototyping ideas, you know, like we saw with this, this avocado um, T-Bot. So these all seem like really exciting um, tools that could help people. 
on the other hand, there's like a lot of negatives you can imagine too, right? So there's things like uh, plagiarism, right? If, if these things are capable of writing code or writing essays, probably people will use this to cheat on things. Um, there's things like if we have models that are very good at generating text, does that make it easier for people to spread uh, rumors and spread disinformation? Um, you know, is there potential of uh, harming people who, yeah, like I said, make their living as illustrators or maybe using these sort of image generation uh, models to generate some sort of um, ex explicit content, right? So these are just all sort of things that I think are, are large positives and large negatives on both sides. And I think this is really why it's important to try to understand, um, you know, what's happening with these models, you know, when they work, how they work, you know, uh, and, and what maybe try to anticipate what some of these issues could be. Um, okay, so that's a little motivation. Um, so where I'm coming from in this whole thing, so I'm, you know, as, as we mentioned, I'm a, I'm a professor at USC. I've been, I guess, in the sort of research world for a while. And so um, the, the, I think the, the view from the research world is that, yes, like the amount of progress we've seen has been very impressive. And I think very few people would, would debate this, that, that the field of AI uh, in the last few years, like the, the, the rate of progress has really been quite astounding. Um, this is a figure from a paper that we published last year. And essentially what it's just showing is various like benchmarks that people have used to measure like how much progress we're making in AI and the kind of rate of progress over time. You can see that there were some like uh, much older things. Um, yeah, so there were um, some benchmarks introduced maybe 25 years ago that kind of progress has climbed up very slowly. Uh, and then if you see these other things that have been introduced that started out much worse and we've just been making these like almost vertical lines of progress. Um, so, so yeah, progress has been going very fast. At the same time, like we have to keep in mind that like things are kind of, um, you know, impressive, but still somewhat inconsistent. And so this is, I think, another really interesting thing to, to think about, especially for, for folks who are learning about computer science, this idea that like computers, these sort of computer systems do actually make a lot of mistakes, right? Um, so I think this, this is like a quite an interesting dichotomy that um, you know, there are many situations, especially the sorts of things when you're first learning to program, where programs are like much more reliable than humans, right? Stuff like doing arithmetic or, or tasks like sorting, right? Some sort of intro CS um, programs, right? Or even things like you know, games where there's like very deep calculation. So things like Connect Four, for instance. Connect Four has been like entirely solved by computers. They know exactly what the optimal move is at every point. There's like no possible way essentially that they can make a mistake playing Connect Four. Um, but the, the kind of the types of methods that underlie these AI systems are very, very different, right? So they're based on, basically all these recent advances are based on a family of techniques known as machine learning. And these operate fundamentally at a, on a very different principle. So the idea of these systems is that they try to observe uh, patterns of behavior from data and then try to basically mimic those patterns, right? So patterns like what does, what does human written text look like, right? Or what do like real photographs look like and try to mimic this behavior, right? And so the conclusion is that like these patterns like might be good or they might be good in some cases and not good in others, right? In, in general, like they might be unreliable. They might be in some sense approximate and moreover, they're trained on things oftentimes that come from, let's say the internet, right? You can scrape the internet and get tons and tons of images and tons and tons of text, but not everything on the internet maybe is something that you actually want a system to mimic, right? There's plenty of bad behavior. There's plenty of bad images that you don't want ever to have um, a model generate. Okay, so um, yeah, again, just some sort of high level thoughts on on what's going on in this in this AI world. Um, so I thought maybe I could illustrate what I'm talking about a little bit with this one example. So um, what I've done here is I, I was thinking about things that I was doing in high school. I remember we read Brave New World in high school. Um, and so I have basically asked this language model, uh, this is something called OPT, which is actually uh, open sourced. And there's like a demo here that anyone can just uh, use if you wanna play around with it. Um, so I've asked it to generate, you know, a very, an award-winning uh, essay about Brave New World. 
and it generates this. And so I think at first glance, like if you start reading this, like it's in a way, it's definitely quite impressive, right? That it can get, um, you know, it can it can clearly write text that sounds, you know, like fluent English text, right? Um, it has some sort of like consistent idea about like that the world is a place of conflict and, you know, the kind of dark themes. Um, there is, however, like some, there are some issues with this essay. And like one that I'll point out is that um, there are these quotes here that um, if you Google these, we're not actually quotes from, from Brave New World. Um, and so uh, this, this gets at what I hinted at earlier, right? These models, like might, maybe we'll generate things that sound good, but that doesn't necessarily mean that what they've generated is true, right? These are just kind of completely irrelevant quotes to, uh, to, to the novel. Um, give a couple other examples of like what things can go wrong. So here is a, uh, this, these are a couple examples from a, um, a chat bot that was released by Facebook recently. And I think that's particularly ironic because you see this person had this conversation and this bot winds up saying <laughs> that Facebook has a lot of fake news on it these days, right? And so this is another reminder that like these, these systems, again, are often trained on data scraped from the internet and not all of the internet is stuff you want to copy. Like surely Facebook probably would not want to copy <laughs> this, uh, this, this um, refrain from, from the internet. Um, and there's even kind of stranger things that can happen. Um, this is an example where this model asserts that like this person is a terrorist. She's a, uh, she's a, yeah, she's a Dutch politician. And I think there's no evidence at all of her being a terrorist, but somehow it has uh, made up this, uh, this accusation somehow. Um, okay, so this is a picture, I guess, both of how, uh, you know, these, these, these models are clearly doing something, but they also perhaps not be uh, cannot be fully trusted. Okay, so uh, what's the plan for the rest of today? Um, I think my overall goal was to try to give kind of like a twofold uh, like understanding of what's happening with these uh, with these uh, AI systems, both sort of at a hands-on level and also a little bit on the technical side, and also maybe give some illustrations of how relatively simple concept you know things kids learn maybe even in middle school or in high school right are. Are kind of related to how these uh, systems work, um, and so the way we're gonna the 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 place I wanted to start is um, I'm actually gonna stop sharing. Uh, yeah, the place I'm gonna start is I put together uh, a couple of fun kind of uh, uh, challenges uh, about can you guess which thing is real and which thing is um, AI generated. So let me actually stop sharing um, for a second. And I guess since we have so few people, we don't even really need to do the breakout room, but I'll just, um, let me get the link. Um, so, uh, so I have this link in the Zoom chat that um, hopefully everyone can look at. I guess everyone can, can play along. We can, we can discuss it uh, as, as one big group. Um, so I have two examples here. The first one is, uh, is, is a text example. So one of these is like a real article from the New York Times. And the other one was basically I gave it the same title of the New York Times article and asked uh, uh, GPT-3, this one of the language models, to, uh, to, to generate an, an article. Um, and then the second one, if you scroll down, is one of them is a real photograph. And the other one is a, uh, is a fake, uh, is, a, is an AI-generated image that is supposed to be mimicking a photograph. Um, yeah, so maybe why don't we just like take a couple minutes, you can think about these, and then we can kind of discuss what everyone thinks, which one looks uh, human, or which one looks real, which one looks uh, AI generated.
Is there a hint that you want to give us? <laughs> Good question. Do, do, which, which, for which one? Um, or both? That. Oh yeah, text, yeah. Actually, really for the struggling. report, you probably share the screen. Yeah. <laughs> I can also share the screen, Anthony. Or um, mm. yeah. So I guess what I was hoping was that you know I think your what I was hoping is that your first impression might be like both of them seem pretty good, right? Um, I I'm think that guess. is. Oh yeah, Debbie. I'm willing to guess. Yeah, go go is that ahead. What you wanted? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want I want people. I'm to guess. guessing the AI generated article B. And the human generated article A. That's my guess. Okay. Why do you why do you say that? Um it's just a reaction to how the sentences are put together. Mm. Uh, article B just feels a lot more clumsy and it meanders in different directions. And article A just feels when I read it more streamlined. So it made mm. me think that Article A was the human and Article B was the computer. Can I also mm. chime in here? Yeah, go ahead. So because of my background, and uh, my background is actually marine biology. Oh, really? OK. Oh. Oh, yeah. so, so, <laughs> so Seafood Watch, I know, is a real group. Um, Oceana, I have never heard of them before. So that, so I'm, that made me freak out. And I'm thinking A is the real one and b is the mm -hmm. ai <laughs> mm -hmm. okay awesome yeah uh anyone else want to uh chime in on this one yeah maybe i'll go back to sharing because i did have a slide on uh, to do the the grand reveal <laughs> um Yeah, I had so, no idea. I couldn't figure out either one. <laughs> yeah, it is like, uh, yeah, like I was saying, I think the, the, uh, you know, at first glance, like it seems like both of them seem pretty reasonable, right? But yeah, uh, you are both correct. Uh, it is uh, the, uh, yeah, article A is the real uh, article, article B was AI generated. Um, yeah, and I think both of you made made very good points. Yeah, I think I do agree. Article B just feels a, yeah, a little clumsy. And also the point about one of them having a real organization and the other one having a fake one. Again, that's, I guess, uh, goes back to what I was talking about, right? These uh, models often tend to like make up stuff, especially things that maybe it, it just like hadn't seen enough times to memorize in the training set, like what's a real seafood watch group and what's not. Um, a couple other things that I uh, wanted to point out here. One thing that often happens with um, AI uh, or these language models in particular is they tend to do a lot of repetition. So uh, the title of this, you know, so in the prompt, I, I gave it like to save whales, don't eat lobster. And then the AI kind of almost repeats the same thing, right? They say like to save whales, people should stop eating lobster. Whereas the, the original article kind of didn't necessarily start there at all. They had, it was a little more kind of creative in, in how they started the article. Um, another thing that I highlighted at the bottom, this is kind of speculation on my part, honestly, but like, um, here's what I'm guessing. What I'm guessing is that a lot of, so, so first of all, the, the, the AI actually, what it gets correct is that exactly why, what the relationship is between eating, the, between lobster and whales. Like I actually had no idea. But both of the articles do talk about this thing where it's like, oh yeah, the like lobster fishing gear is like harmful to whales. And so what, what that tells me is that like somewhere, there are probably other articles online that discuss uh, this sort of problem. And the AI has, pro has probably like seen enough of that to know that it can, it, that, that this is why, uh, why this, uh, this uh, title is there. Um, but what I suspect is that a lot of those a lot of the information about that might not be in like news articles. It might be on articles that are maybe more opinionated, right? That are trying to like encourage people to, uh, you know, encourage consumers to do something, right? So part of the end of this article, I felt like feels a little like, um, I don't know, kind of like you're like speaking to the audience and kind of like asking them to like think about the health of the planet and something in a way that maybe like a news article that's trying to be more objective 
wouldn't do. So I think this, if sort of a hypothesis, but the, I, um, I guess the broader point there is that like the, the model learns all these sorts of patterns, right? So one pattern it might learn is like, oh, if I'm writing, if I see an article about like whales and lobster and, and these sort of issues, it's probably that, that are, those, most of those articles have a particular style and then it will try to write, continue writing in that same style. In this case, that's a little at odds with uh, trying to generate and use other comparisons. Um, okay. Uh, what about what about this uh, the second one these uh, these two bowls uh, any any ideas here I th I think this one's harder um, but I, well, I thought this one did you already give us the answer with the it, yeah he did no oh sorry the the green the green and red is not the answer sorry the green oh, and red was not? not intended to be the answer it was I was so I was I was I was originally planning for people to like vote on Zoom with like the little buttons uh, <laughs> that are like green and red. Uh, green and red is not which one's AI, which one's not. So, uh, well, I ahead. thought it was. I'm go sorry. Ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say B seemed like the the not real photo the AI made one because it just looks so clean and perfect. <laughs> mm, interesting. Okay, so you think because A looks a little messier, it's more more real. Yeah. yeah. Debbie, did you have the same thought? Or? Yeah, so my thought was um, putting the bowl on a patterned background, but then the background sort of disappears as it goes back. So that's what mm. I was looking at. Yeah. Um, that's a lot of variation versus just the white, the black, and then the bowl. So it like scraped a bowl image and then threw it on another one. Oh, interesting. So you think the background, you think the background in A looks too complex for an AI to generate. Is that kind of what you're saying? Not too complex, but why would it go to that degree of complexity for the bottom when you're talking? I don't know about the bowl. I see. I, see. I, I actually thought that A might, could be the AI only because the first one you tricked us or could have easily tricked us. And I'm thinking that maybe this one, it, it's a more complex program. It's in. Uh, with the whole distressed look, <laughs> that that might yeah. be uh, the, the one that's trying to fool us. So I, I, I'm thinking A is actually the AI. And then the oh, only yeah. reason I would support that one is because B looks like it has a teeny chip to the left side of the bowl in the front. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. So that. those are the yeah. those mm -hmm. are the two ways my mind kept going back and forth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, so. that's a good observation. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't notice that either. Um, okay, so uh, the answer is that actually Anthony was right. So uh, the left one is is AI generated. Um, it was interesting your comment about the background. I actually thought that the least realistic thing about this background is the fact that it kind of just like fades into like blurriness. Like it seems like a real like tile. It seems like it looks like it's on like a tile floor or something, but like that wouldn't happen in like a real tile. Um, I guess the other thing is like, you can notice like right here, like this also looks kind of weird, like the line, this line kind of like the grout, I think it's called, like it just like kind of stops here and then like resumes on the other side, like slightly off. I don't know, like something about the tile, I think looks a little off. Um, and maybe that's the best clue, but yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's tough. <laughs> um, okay, um, yeah, thanks for <laughs> thanks for thanks for participating. Um, hope that was interesting. Um, so yeah, at this point, I think maybe it's a good time we can take like maybe five minute break um, and you know go to the bathroom, stretch or whatever, and then when we come back, I'm gonna do a little bit of a lecture on like the sort of technical side right so how what's actually going on under the hood like how do these models work and hopefully in a way that you'd be, even some of your students maybe would be able to uh understand so yeah stay tuned Welcome back, everybody. Oh, are we starting now? Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
uh, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, welcome back. Yeah. Um, cool. So, um, yeah, I wanted to just talk, like I said, a little bit about kind of, I guess, a brief intro to machine learning in general, and then try to kind of tie back at least some of these concepts to, yeah, how do these text and image generation uh, models actually work? Um, so, yeah, so to start off, yeah, just to go back to this, this distinction I was making earlier to you know, what, you, what you might say is like normal programming versus machine learning. Um, uh, right, so, so oftentimes when, when you're writing code, right, the, the programmer is in this position where they kind of know exactly what, you know, what steps, what sequence of instructions computer wants to do, right? You know an algorithm that like, you know, gives a correct solution, right? And because of that, you can be very confident um, you know, assuming you've not written bugs in your code, that the computer will actually go and do the right thing, right? So for things like yeah, doing math or maybe like solving a maze, uh, things like that. Um, but in a sense, this is limiting, right? Because you're only limited to solving problems where you already know how to solve them in a sense. Um, machine learning is very useful for a whole range of other types of problems, essentially where the programmer doesn't know, you know, how to solve this problem directly. Um, so instead, the, the strategy is you basically acquire what's called a training data set, uh, which basically has a lot of these like input output pairs, right? So what is the input and what is the correct output for each of these? And then the program you actually write is something that looks at this data set and then kind of figures out what are the patterns here? And then based on that, like what is kind of the rule for generating the correct output given the input, right? And so whether or not this winds up being reliable basically depends a lot on like how generalizable these patterns uh, that have been extracted actually are. Um, okay. Um, so just to illustrate kind of when, you know, what, what are these sorts of cases? Like why, why, why do we need machine learning? Uh, this is like a nice uh, web comic that I like, uh, it's called, called XACD. So um, this particular one, so, here we have like this person saying, suggesting, oh, you know, when a user takes a photo, let's check whether they're in a national park. And the programmer is like, oh yeah, that's easy, right? Because, well, you know, you can probably uh, get a map of all the, where all the national parks are. Uh, and you can just kind of program directly, you know, some, some write, a, write a function that says like, oh, based on this uh, GPS coordinate, is, is this inside the park or outside of the park, right? This is maybe not that, simple for a human, um, but you can kind of, you know, directly uh, write a program that does this. Um, okay, and then the comment continues. Oh, let's also check whether the photo is of a bird and the programmer says, I'll need a research team in five years, um, right? And so this is something, this is like, I guess in some ways surprising, uh, uh, you know, because like determining if there's a, if the photo is a bird or not is like very straightforward for a human being who knows what a bird is. But then you try to sit down and write a program for this. And you're like, how do, how do I define like what makes a bird a bird, right? There's like all these different sorts of birds. And then there's like bats and airplanes and all these things that are not birds, but like kind of look like birds. Um, and so these are exactly the sorts of things where, um, you know, machine learning is, kind of makes, makes a ton of sense here, right? We can't directly kind of define what the essence of looking like a bird is, but we can definitely find a lot of images of birds and images of not birds and have the, 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 the program kind of learn to differentiate between the two. Okay, so um, I mentioned that I wanted to link kind of machine learning, like, like core machine learning ideas to text and image generation. And so I'm gonna talk about these two kind of, perhaps the two like most classic problems in machine learning um, and then they're going to map on to text and images. Uh, so the first, um, this is, I think, where a lot of machine learning classes start, is this problem called uh, regression. And regression just means that we're trying to predict something that is a numerical value. So for example, suppose I'm, you know, growing this plant, um, and I want to just predict, like, how tall uh, is this plant going to grow eventually? Um, and so the input is going to be like some information about it. So things like maybe how much fertilizer am I giving it or like what species of plant, uh, is it right. Um, and then, uh, you know, we're trying to, and trying to predict the height. And so importantly here, like, like I was saying, right, like as a programmer, like I don't necessarily know anything about plants or biology. 
I don't really know like what is the best way to predict plant height based on these characteristics. Um, but I, it turns out I don't really need to know that because um, I can, uh, if I have enough training data, I can kind of have the program infer what is, uh, what is a good way to, to make these sorts of predictions. Okay. Um, so in the context of regression, there's like, again, one very like classic method here, which is called linear regression. And so the way linear regression works is that we're first going to have something called a feature vector. Uh, the point is just that like, it's the, the, the way the computer is gonna like understand the, the, the properties of the plant is to turn it into a list of numbers. And so, you know, for this particular plant, I'll, I'll turn it into this uh, list of four numbers where the first number represents like how much uh, fertilizer did I give it? And then we're gonna have three, um, what's known as like indicator features, um, which are basically saying like, which species is it, right? So like, you can think of this as just like a, a, a binary expression, right? So is it a cactus, is it a ficus, is it a sunflower? Um, and so based on these features, um, the program we're gonna, we're gonna uh, ultimately run uh, is going to uh, make a prediction based on what are called its parameters. So these are just a bunch of other numbers, all these blue numbers. And these blue numbers basically determine exactly like how the program behaves. Uh, and for linear regression in particular, the way it works is we're just gonna kind of take all the features and like multiply them by the parameters. So the way to interpret this is like, the, the model currently thinks that like for every ounce of fertilizer you have that like adds two inches to the plant's height. And then like, you know, if, if the plant is a cactus kind of you should add another five inches or if it's a ficus, you should add another 12 inches uh, and so forth. And then you just like add all these up and return the total and this is how how you make um, how you make a prediction? Okay, so now like the only real like tricky thing that's left is to say like okay, how do we actually find the parameters, right? Because again, I don't know anything about biology. I have no idea whether these numbers are, are right or not. Um, and so this is where this training data comes in, right? We're going to learn good parameters uh, by uh, looking at a training data set and trying to basically make our machines uh, predictions close as possible to what actually happened in the world. So let's say that I first, I have already grown like a couple plants. So maybe I have, I have my first training plant uh, that I gave two units of fertilizer and it was a ficus. And maybe this grew like 16 inches tall. Uh, and then I have a second plant, which is the same species, but I did not give it any fertilizer. Uh, and maybe it grew like 10 inches. Um, okay, so based on this, like we can actually kind of start trying already trying to like fit what are the best uh, parameters that kind of explain this this data. So in this case, like what seems to make sense? Well, it seems to make sense that like the kind of base height of the ficus plant is like ten inches, uh, because based on this this plant here. And then it seems like for every ounce of fertilizer we added, that added about like three inches, right? Because we added two ounces and it was six inches taller. So these are the parameters that we would we would infer, right? So three for the fertilizer and ten for the is ficus uh, feature. And I guess what's worth noting here is like essentially what we've done is like some I don't know middle school math. Like we've basically solved the two by two system of linear equations in order to do this. Um, and in fact, like the real way like you solve these is actually quite similar. In some ways, you can think of it as a generalization of like solving systems of linear equations. Um, so I think, I think that's kind of a fun, uh, fun connection. Um, okay. Um, any questions about this like regression thing before we, before we move on? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so regression, remember, so that was this task of like trying to predict a real number given some input. And the other like very classic paradigm uh, type of machine learning problem is what's called classification. In classification, we're given an input and trying to predict like a label or like some sort of category, right? So for example, you get a picture um, of an animal and you wanna identify what species of animal it is. Um, so how we're gonna go about this is actually overall quite similar. Um, so again, we're gonna need some sort of uh, feature vector to represent uh, the input. So for an image, for example, uh, one kind of natural thing to do is to just 
take every every uh, pixel, right? So there's like a, a number of pixels in the width dimension multiplied by the height. And then for each one of those, you have uh, three numbers, right? Because there's like a red, green, and blue uh, brightness value. And so you're going to have a feature vector that's, yeah, width times height by three um, numbers long. And that is, yeah, that, that replaces the like list of four numbers that we had um, before. OK, so now the question is like, OK, what are the, what are the parameters of this model? These are the features. Um, one way to go about this is to say, instead of just having like a single kind of set of parameters, I'm now going to have one set of parameters for each label, right? So again, in regression, we had this like one set of parameters. And when we use that one set of parameters, we got like a single number out, right? Um, now we're going to think of it as like for each possible label, we're going to have one parameter vector that gives us a number out. And that number basically represents like how good of a match is this input to that particular label or class? Um, yeah, so for example, if you get uh, you know, this image, let's say, um, we're going to basically, for each of these labels, right? So for the whale, we have like a set of whale parameters and we do the same computations before, we get a score for how whale-like it is uh, and similarly for ladybug and so forth. And ultimately, you know, what you would hope is that the model assigns has the highest score to uh, ladybug, and then we're going to kind of return that as the um, as as the output. Okay. So, um, and again, right to, to actually learn these parameters, you you collect some sort of training data, and you you uh, encourage the score for the correct answer to be high and the score for everything else to be, to be low. Um, okay. So these are really kind of the two these two like very classic uh, machine learning primitives. And in a way, I think we can understand what's happening with text and image generation in these same terms. So um, text generation, essentially what's happening, you can think of it as just repeated classification. Uh, you, the model basically chooses a word and then it chooses based on that word, what the next word is. And then based on those two words, the next word is. This is the, in fact, literally how uh, models are actually trained. They're trained on a classification style uh, objective, right? So just to illustrate this, right? Instead of a picture, now we have basically like a, a prefix and then like a little blank. Um, and just like before, the model is going to kind of score every possible, now this is every possible word in the vocabulary. So you might have a vocabulary that's like, I don't know, 30,000 words or something. Um, and it assigns a score to every one of these and decides kind of which one looks the best. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, so in, in a way, this is kind of like all that's going on in text generation. Um, but there is kind of one thing I need to mention, which is that um, instead of the sort of uh, more simple version of classification that I showed before, the current models are doing something uh, called called deep learning, right? Or you may have also uh, heard the term neural networks. And I guess think these days it's kind of deep learning is kind of just means like using neural networks that are large. <laughs> um, so so what is deep learning? How does it differ from the stuff I was showing before? Um, so previously I was kind of saying that we just as programmers we would basically decide what features we cared about, right? So we we, we would make the decision to say like, okay, my feature vector is gonna be like amount of fertilizer and like which species it is and so forth, right? Um, the whole idea of deep learning is to basically say like, okay, we don't actually want to like leave that decision even up to the programmers. We can also learn which features um, are, are useful. So the, the, at a high level, like how, how does this work? Neural network or these deep learning models are kind of built like a really tall cake. Right, so there's there's many layers. So um, at the first layer, you use some sort of you know simple features, the sort of things we saw already. So for for text, the features might be something as simple as uh, you might just have like a a uh, a very long list. Let's say you know if you have thirty thousand words in the vocabulary, there might be a list that's like thirty thousand uh, long, and like almost everything is zero, and there might be like a one in the position that corresponds to like the actual word. Uh, so something like that. Um, so very simple features that just describe what what this uh, what this input is. 
Um, and then this goes through many layers. And essentially each layer is taking the features from the previous layer and kind of combining them in some way. So for example, you can imagine them doing some sort of like um, conjunction, right? So like an and of different things, like maybe you look, you're looking for things that like have the word best and the word things, you know, stuff like that. Um, and then you go through like many, many layers. And, you know, as you stack on more and more layers, this can kind of do more and more complicated, you know, combinations of the, uh, of the original uh, input features. Then at the final layer, everything just works the same way I've been describing, right? So you again, just use this final layer as the, uh, the, the, the new features and you generate one score for each possible next word. And again, you know, you hope that the thing that makes sense has the, uh, has the highest score. Um, the, the, and, you know, just as we saw that like when we're training these simpler models, right, we can kind of infer like which parameters kind of fit the data, right? Similarly here, each of these layers has a bunch of kind of parameters that determine kind of which combinations of features from the previous layer we want to form. Um, and you can kind of train uh, all those parameters to say like, okay, actually only keep, like do the, form the complex features that are actually useful for uh, predicting uh, this, this final label. And so in this way, um, Although I guess the term for this is back propagation, if you've heard this, this term. And so that's, that's able to, yeah, train the parameters at every one of these layers and ultimately find, yeah, useful, uh, useful features. And yeah, so when you see, I think most of the recent kind of machine learning success stories, such as these text uh, and image generation models or things like the, or the Go AI for a few years ago, for example, all these uh, really make heavy use of uh, these deep learning. Ideas. Okay, so that's kind of the one. Uh, that's kind of the one secret sauce here. But otherwise, right? It's essentially, like I said, just kind of doing classification many, many times. Um, okay, and then like image generation. Like, what's what's how does image generation work? Um, essentially, the 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 current paradigm for doing image generation is this thing called uh, diffusion model. And the way diffusion models work is that like text generation, it would be really nice to be able to break this down into like a series of steps, each of which is like not that big. And we might hope that, that, a, that a model can do. And so diffusion models in particular um, treat each step as kind of undoing uh, noise. So um, let's, let, let's look at this, this uh, picture here. So we've started on the left with just like a normal picture of a cat. And then uh, as we go further to the right, we just add more noise. We just like randomize some of the values of the pixels, essentially. Um, and you know, at the far right, everything is just like completely random, right? Um, so going from left to right is like very easy to. It's very easy to write a program that goes from left to right. You, know, you just randomize stuff. And then the tasks that we train the model to do is to just go in the reverse direction, right? So start with this like kind of noised version of a cat and try to make it a little less uh, less noisy. Okay, so if you think about like what's what's what that problem is like essentially this is just like a ton of regression problems at the same time right so I mentioned earlier right each image you can just think of as uh, or it, it, it is represented as like width times height times three uh, numbers right and so essentially what this means is we just have like width times height times three regression problems each of those is predicting like the red or green or blue value at a particular pixel. Um, and we just like make a prediction for each one of those that gives us like a new version of the image uh, given the old image. And then we just keep doing this many, many times and like, you know, squeeze out more and more of the noise. Uh, so there's like a nice animation here that, that uh, shows this. Let me see. Okay, here we go. Yeah, so you can see that, um, this is just an illustration of a model actually doing this. It starts from completely random noise. Yeah, it starts from completely random noise. You can see slowly over many iterations, it's, it just falls into one of these very recognizable um, handwritten digits. Um, okay, yeah, and just to uh, mention it, yeah. So this also uses, uh, uses makes have use of deep learning. Um, 
Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. So I, I'll do one more quick comment, and then we can do the second <laughs> quickly. Maybe try the second activity. Um, the comment I wanted to make here is so like what what is this uh, like what 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 kind of uses understanding these uh, things on the technical side? I think one thing is just like. I think understanding a little bit better what's happening in these models maybe helps us understand their failure cases. So we, let's go back to this um, very first example, right, about these, these quotations. Uh, so when I look at this, like what I think is probably going on, right, is that the model probably has learned some sort of feature that's like, oh, we're in the middle of some sort of famous quotation, right? Um, remember that like, for deep learning models, they can kind of learn what features are useful for prediction. And it seems reasonable to think that like, whether you're in like a famous quotation or just in like a normal, normal like new piece of text is probably useful for predicting what the next word should be, right? Um, and so when the feature is on, like the model probably knows what some common like quotations are, right? Or common, uh, you know, dramatically said phrases, you know, like I've been to the mountain. Um, but the model is apparently not quite good enough to like actually know what quote fits uh, the correct context, right? So this is the sense in which these features are ha have been in, are, are useful for doing the task, but they're still a bit kind of approximate. Okay, um, so that concludes the little like technical section. The thing I wanted to do in the last uh, last uh, few minutes here is um, I wanna just give you a chance if you haven't already done so to actually play with some of these image generation models. So what's actually kind of still quite a recent development is that, um, yeah, there's some like models that are uh, have free demos online and anyone can just play with them. And I think that's actually one of probably the best ways to get more intuition about like uh, how they, you know, when they work and, and, and where they still fail. There's still a lot of, uh, still a lot of things I'm sure you'll find that doesn't do what you want. Um, so there's this, uh, this link I have, um, some could put it in the chat as well, maybe, or you can just type it. Um, so this is one particular model called stable diffusion, which you may or may not have heard about. Uh, but it's, it's, it's one of these models where, uh, um, like that avocado, uh, teapot example from the beginning, you can input a uh, caption and it'll try to produce an image that like fits that caption. And so um, I think what would be good is if, you know, we can all just take a few minutes and try to, on one hand, you know, try to create something either, you know, something that looks really cool or something that you find funny, uh, you know, something that you would like to show to people. Um, but then on the other hand, also keep track of kind of these negative cases. So when does the model seem to not understand things properly? Um, or, or maybe does it do anything that might be problematic in some, in some sense? Um, so yeah, let's just take a few minutes and uh, play around there. Oh yeah, I wanted to show one thing. Let me, uh, um, there's like one thing I wanted to suggest. Uh, do you guys see my browser now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the one thing I want to suggest is like there's this little bar on the right that's number of images. And I think it's nice to generate maybe like four, or you could even do more, like six images or something. So I can type something like uh, astronaut. <laughs> and Robin, it, uh, there's yeah. a question in the chat that this requires uh, oh. signing up. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So you will, yes, you we do have to. Sign up. Hopefully, it's not a big deal. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I think you just give them some email address or something. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I'm not affiliated with them in any way or anything. I just like it's one of the like free demos that, uh, like a startup, uh, like created this free demo. Yes. Um, yeah. So you can get stuff that looks like this maybe. Um, Yes, you can also sign in with your Google account uh, a little easier. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, maybe we can take until, I guess, uh, do we do we have like wrap up stuff to do after? Uh, so yeah, maybe we can just take like a few minutes and play around and then we can do a brief like show and tell, I guess, <laughs> what, what people found.
Welcome, Veronica. We're just um, playing around with uh, Dr. Gia's program that's in the chat box for you. Yeah. Okay, it is not my program, but it's a, it's a demo of a image generation system. And I think it's just a fun way to kind of get some, uh, yeah, hands-on knowledge about like kind of what these systems can do, maybe what they can't do. Thank you. I'm here. I'm on the road, but I'm listening in. Thank you. Oh, okay. Veronica, just so you know, the entire lecture is being recorded. So you'll be able to go back and listen to all the wonderful uh, information we received this evening. Thank you. Thank you. So the goal was to put words uh, in to the dialogue box at the bottom and see what images came out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. just like kind of try a few different things mm -hmm. and try to see, you know, do you, do you think Thank it you did sure. a good job or bad job? Yeah, I, maybe I should have said this, but I guess there's also a little button. So you can download any of these and if you want to show them. <laughs> if you have any good, interesting example, you can show them. Okay. Yeah, maybe. 
Uh, yeah, I guess since we're pretty close to the end, yeah, maybe, yeah. Does anyone have any sort of interesting uh, examples they would uh, like to show? Is screen sharing enabled for everyone? Yes, uh, I can go ahead and do that now. Okay, yeah. You should, you, uh, everybody has the um, ability to share screen now. Mm -hmm. I can share my screen, if you like. Yeah, go ahead. Thought this was interesting. <laughs> um, you can tell that it took many images and put it together to create this. Um, that is interesting. I don't know if you can actually see like right here, um, the choppiness, the inconsistencies. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember seeing anything like this, so I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist. <laughs> but um, it was pretty cool um, to see kind of like what I, I was looking for. So at first mm -hmm. I put Tulum, um, Mexico, and then it gave me a nice beach and a bunch of beaches type of pictures. And then mm -hmm. uh, once I added the, the word ruins, it kind of focused more on, on different ruins by themselves. And once I added the word beach, then it gave me this. <laughs> I was mm. like, wow, this is really cool. Nice. So it was nicely, uh, I think it exemplified what AI was doing, you know, mm -hmm. um, really well with this picture. All right, that's yeah. good. Yeah, that's a good example. Yeah. I'm not sure how to stop sharing. <laughs> Oh, Debbie, did you have a chance to? I did, and what I'll add is, mm -hmm. okay, backing this up. Yeah. Google was there was a lot of our uh, play lately. How Google is making games so students could spot misinformation quicker and be more attuned to it, mm -hmm. and I feel like. Now that I've played in this, if you gave me the two vases, I would mm -hmm. be much quicker to, to, um, to, to figure out which was the AI generated. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting. Like primed my, does that make sense? In yeah, 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 that makes sense. But if you, yeah. play the, if you play those Google games, they don't tell mm -hmm. you what to do and they don't, uh, um, they're not to shame you. They just mm -hmm. give you a series of uh, things to play with so you get better at spotting it. Right. And I feel like that's what we did here. Mm -hmm. And it made me quicker to spot it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so um, that was like, wow, right. Um, and with that, I don't know, I could show you. So I played with, um, um, I'll share this. Can you see it? Yeah. So I started out with uh, Starry Night, and then mm -hmm. I added the Degas Dancer, and then I added Renoir, and it just kept mashing them together. Right. So I can even show you if we start off with, so now. And there's so, so many of these pictures on, on the internet that I mean, that's not it, but, and in fact, when you do it, it's a different picture each time. Right, yes. Yeah, so there is like a lot of randomness involved. Yeah, yeah. so interesting. And then I added onto it, um, Starry Night. Mm -hmm. And again, like I said, it now makes me much more astute in picking out the generated image mm -hmm. to know what to look for. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's 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 great to hear. Yeah, and I think that's one of I think that's one of the really cool things. Like, now that there are various demos like this, I think they are definitely good, potentially very good educational tools. Exactly. Um, yeah. For my high school class, <laughs> which I keep mm -hmm. talking about over and over again, like this would be great as a as I'm as teaching them. Mm -hmm. And then I added the Renoir. And it just completely kept mashing different mm -hmm. artists together that are not the yeah. same generation right. or style. Cool, cool. Um, awesome. Yeah. So I think it's basically time to uh, 
time to wrap up. I just had a, yeah, I guess I just had like this little conclusion slide. Um, but yeah, basically, yeah. So, so, so as we talked about, you know, these, these, these models I think are quite impressive. I think it's really fun to yeah, play around with these and understand them. I think also on the technical side, hopefully it's possible to explain at least to some extent what's going on to these students. Um, and I think this is really important as like these models like get used in more and more ways and Im impacting what's happening uh, in, the, in, the, in the broader world. So yeah, thank you very much for, uh, thank you very much for coming. Right. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, which screen are, are you seeing? My screen. Yes. Okay. So we just wanted to conclude and just uh, let you know of some other opportunities that are available to you. Um, right now, we definitely have a strategies for effective and inclusive teaching course, which is a free uh, synchronous course with a weekly. Um, sorry a free um, asynchronous course with a weekly one hour virtual synchronous meeting um, that's again focused on uh, strategies for your computer science class and making sure that it is um, inclusive uh, of everyone and, and just really um, attacking the, addressing the need for equity in, in the computer science classroom. The other thing is we wanna make sure that you're also aware uh, of our next um, speaker, Dr. Uh, Professor Somio Bonzel with Safety and Robotics, and then also, of course, our, um, whoops, sorry, um, and then I just want to make sure that in the chat box, uh, you've got our uh, evaluation for today, and so please take a few moments to fill that out, but again, thank you. We'll be, uh, again, uh, this recording will be released to all of you, and then this will also be uh, posted up on a website as well, so you can share this with your colleagues. And again, please encourage your colleagues to join us for the remaining uh, speakers in this series. Thank you, Anthony. And I just wanted to add also to teachers, we'll be sending up a follow-up email to give you the opportunity to connect with Professor Gia if you are interested in, in further building those connections and um, connecting him to your classroom and to your work that's being done in the classroom. Um, so keep an eye out for that email. But I also want to say thank you so much for spending your, your afternoon, evening with us. It was a pleasure to hear from you, Professor Robin Gia, as well. So thank yes. you. Big hand for Dr. For Dr. Robin. Gia. Yes, it was amazing. Thank you. That concludes our uh, speaker series for today. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and uh, we'll stick around if you want to just chit chat for a bit. Mm -hmm.